this video, we're going to talk about harmonic functions and in particular, what is their relation to analytic or holomorphic functions? Remember, analytic and holomorphic are synonyms for each other. So before we get going into that, we need to make sure we're all on the same page about a few things. So the first thing, let's let D be some subset of the plane. A function u, whose domain is d and spits out a real number, so u is a function of two real variables, we're going to call it harmonic on this domain d, if 1, u satisfies Laplace's equation, which says that the second partial of u with respect to x plus the second partial of u with respect to y adds up to 0. And so that should hold for all points x, comma y you plug into that function when x, y come from that domain d. And the second thing that I need u to satisfy if it's harmonic is that both of these second partials are continuous throughout the domain D. So both of these together say use harmonic. Now the next thing that we need to be comfortable with is, now let's think about D as a subset of the complex plane. So like, you know, the, the, the plane R2, the Cartesian plane, we can think of it like the complex plane, just kind of labeled a little bit differently. And now we're gonna let it be a domain, where domain in this context has a little bit more meaning to it. It means an open connected set. So like just if you need a picture, a mental image, Think about it's like a little blob here where I have these dotted lines along the boundary so that the boundary is not part of the set. Kind of like an open interval where like use parentheses to say the endpoints aren't part of the set. Okay, so D is a domain in the complex plane. A function F, you know, whose inputs come from D and it spits out a complex number. So F is a function of a complex variable. We're going to say that it's holomorphic or another word for that is analytic on D. If for each point Z naught in D, the derivative of F exists for all points Z sufficiently near Z naught. And to try to give you a picture on what on earth that means, you know, I'm not just saying that the derivative exists at Z naught, it's got to hold when you're close to Z naught too. It has to exist when you're close to Z naught. So in a picture, what I'm saying to you is if you've got Z naught in D, you should be able to find some little disk that is centered at Z naught and still fits entirely inside of D such that for all points Z within that disk, the derivative is defined at all such points. Further, if F has real and imaginary parts, U and V respectively, so like the real and imaginary parts of a complex function or you know, real value functions of two real variables, then to say that F is holomorphic at Z naught, that's equivalent if and only if uh, it's true if and only if the Cauchy-Riemann equations hold at Z0, and I have those written for you above. Uh, it says the partial of u with respect to x equals partial v with y, and then also that minus partial u with y equals partial v with x. So the CR equations have to hold, and each of these first-order partial derivatives of u and v, they all have to be continuous, again, sufficiently near z0. So like there has to be some little disk centered at z0 such that all of these first partials of u and v uh, have to be continuous inside of that disk. So here's a question. What is the connection between, one, harmonic functions of two real variables, and two, holomorphic functions of a single complex variable? So how are these two things related to each other? So that's what we're going to explore a little bit more in this video. So here's the theorem that tells me how they're related. Let's let D be a domain in the complex plane. Let's let F be a function, a, comp a function of a complex variable. Let's say it has real part U and imaginary part V. If F is holomorphic on D, and if the second partials of U and V are continuous on D, so if both of these two hypotheses are satisfied, then both U and V the real and imaginary parts of my function f are harmonic on d. So we're going to prove this. So again, what we're showing is if you've got an analytic function, and if the second partials are nice, then each of its pieces, the real and imaginary parts, they're nice too. What I mean by that is they're harmonic. So how do we prove this? So let's suppose that f is holomorphic on d. That tells me that the CR equations hold on d. So here they are, right? Partial ux equals partial vy, partial uy equals minus partial vx. And I'm gonna look at this, I'm gonna do two things to it. So I've got a little like t-chart to separate the two things I'm gonna do. First, I'm gonna differentiate both sets of equations here with respect to x. So I'm just gonna kind of put the partial differentiation operator with respect to x out front in white on both sides of each of the equations. And uh, yeah, you could simplify like the first one, d dx of du dx, that's definitely d squared u dx squared, but I'm leaving it unsimplified on purpose for right now, just so you can kind of track what I'm doing. And then what I'm also gonna do on the other side is I'm gonna differentiate both the CR equations with respect to y. So same idea, there's the first equation differentiated with respect to y, and here's the second one. And uh, notice that I went ahead and I moved the minus sign on the second equation, I moved it over to the left side. 
All right, so by hypothesis, the second partials are continuous, and you might remember what that buys us, or you might be wondering what that buys us. And what that buys us is that the mixed partial derivatives, so the mixed second partials, they are equal. So in other words, uh, you might have heard that you might have heard that explained as the second partials commute whenever these second partials are continuous. So like um, when you differentiate u with respect to x then with respect to y, it's the same thing as if you did u with respect to y then with respect to x. So what that tells me then, if I look up here where the some of the mixed partials are, he, uh, that tells me that these two underline in blue have to be the same because you're just switching the order of x and y. And similarly, these two in orange, uh, as far as u goes, have to be the same because again, you're just switching the order of whether you differentiate x or y first. Now, what we're gonna do is substitute in the corresponding unmixed partials. So if you look at the other side of either of the blue equations or either of the orange equations there, the other side that's not underlined, those are the unmixed partials. And so if I look at the other side of the blue equations, well, if the blues are the same, then the reds have to be the same. So here is where I can say second partial of u with x has to be minus second partial of u with y. And uh, again, if the oranges are the same, well, then the other sides, the greens, have to be the same. So here, second partial of u with x has to be second partial of u with y. Now what we're going to do is just get zero on a side of both of these equations. And if you just say add the negative parts over, you see second partial u with x plus second partial u with y is zero. And same thing for v. And if you think about that for just a moment, that says that u and v each satisfy Laplace's equation. And that finishes that u and v are harmonic on this domain d. Be careful, you know, in a math class, we just proved like a P implies Q, an implication, and what uh, we, we wonder sometimes is, is the converse, Q implies P, is that true? Be careful, it's not true in general, you have to be a little bit careful. So in other words, if you're given two harmonic functions, U and V, if I try to put them together to make a complex function, U plus IV, that need not be holomorphic. So like harmonic pieces don't necessarily imply a holomorphic complex function. And I'm not going to talk through too many of the details with the example. I'll just kind of set it up for you. Let's take D to be this donut, or a more mathy word for that is an annulus. And so it's between these two circles. That's the domain here. And let's let U be the function natural log of X squared plus Y squared. So you can show that U is harmonic on this domain. But what you should also think about and try to show is that that function, natural log of X squared plus Y squared, it can't be the real part of any analytic function on this domain. And so that would show that the converse doesn't hold all the time. So this domain, this annulus here, um, it's got a big hole in the middle. So what if I look at maybe nicer domains? So a little note here, what if your domain is simply connected or contractible? And for our intents and purposes, just think, what if your domain doesn't have a big hole in it like this donut does? Then that case in the converse is true. Uh, in other words, if the pieces are, if the real and imaginary parts of a complex function are harmonic, then you can conclude that the real and, that the that the function itself is holomorphic on D. So, like in other words, in that case, it's an if and only if, right? Harmonic real and imaginary parts, if and only if, when you put them together as u plus iv, you get a holomorphic function. It's kind of cool. All right, so moving along, the next definition we want to look at, let's say we've got, we're in a nice situation where we've got a simply connected domain. So like, you know, a domain with no holes in it. And let's say that you've got a harmon harmonic function u on d. So right, u is a function of two real variables. A function v that's also defined on d, so v is a function of two real variables. We're going to call that a harmonic conjugate of u if, when I put them together as u plus iv, that defines a function of a complex variable. So if that complex function is holomorphic on d. So let's look at a little example, and this will show you kind of a method. If you're given a U, how do you find its harmonic conjugate? What's, what's a process to try to do that? So let's take, for example, our domain to just be the whole complex plane. And let's say U is the function that is defined as E to the X cosine of Y plus E to the Y cosine of X plus XY. So I'm telling you that use harmonic, but it's not too hard. You could check it if you want to. And what I want to do is I want to find the harmonic conjugate to U on this domain D, in other words, on the complex plane. So what we need to do is we need to find a function v such that u plus iv is holomorphic on c. So here's how we'll do that. I'm going to scroll up a little bit. We're going to use the CR equations, and I'm going to write them down. I know the CR equations tell me partial ux equals partial vy, and what I've highlighted there in a little box is you've got a formula for u up here, and you could take the partial derivative of that with respect to x. Go ahead and do that. So if you take the partial derivative of the yellow up there with respect to x, here's what you should get. And I'm keeping that, again, box, just so you can kind of track what it is. And I'm going to call this equation star, just because for reference later. 
And the second of the CR equations is minus partial UI equals partial VX. And uh, same thing, you've got an expression for U up here. You can take its partial derivative with respect to Y, no problem. And so here is what you should get if you do that. And just because I'm gonna reference this in a moment, let's call this equation double star. So we've obtained expressions for what the partials of V look like. Now, what we'll do is we're gonna try to pick one of these equations to play with. It'd be great if I can just get an expression for V to show up. And if I take the first uh, equation with one star up there, what if I integrate that with respect to y? If I do that, then the right-hand side should just be v. So let's go ahead and try that. So I take the integral of both sides of equation star with respect to y. Now on the left side, that's not too hard. I know how to integrate those things and there's nothing really tricky there, except for at the very end, when I integrate with respect to y, you know, normally you're used to like plus c, where c is any constant. Here, any function of just x is going to be constant with respect to y. So I have plus h of x there. And on the right side, we just get a V. So we have obtained an expression for V that's pretty darn good, but I don't know, you know what specific function of X is allowable uh, to be there. So what is H? We win the game, we know what V looks like if we can say what H looks like. All right, so how do we figure out what H is? Well, if I look at equation double star, let's go up and look at a double star again. Double star tells me that you know what the partial of V with respect to X looks like. It has to be E to the X sine of Y minus E to the Y cosine of X minus X. And now I have an expression for V and I can take the derivative of that with respect to X. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're gonna take the partial derivative with respect to X of our expression for V in red. And here's what you should get. And notice, you know, when you take the partial derivative of H, that's just the derivative of H because H only depends on X. And I know that should be equal to uh, what we said was boxed in pink up there. And if you notice what happens, a lot of things cancel. And so the E to the X sine of Y's cancel, the minus E to the Y cosines of X cancel, and you should just get that H prime of X is negative X. And so we could figure out what h looks like. If I integrate both sides, I get that h looks like minus x squared over two plus some constant. So there are lots of allowable answers for what h is. So just to kind of track what we did, up here, I had no idea what h looks like. I just knew I was off by some function of x. Now I know that h is this uh, quadratic minus x squared plus two, and then you can shift it you know, any way you want, up or down, so plus c. So to put it all together, we just figured out that a harmonic conjugate for u could be any function of the form e to the x sine of y minus e to the y sine of x plus y squared over 2 minus x squared over 2 plus some constant. And any constant c will work. So lots of harmonic conjugates. So got a little theorem here. Let's let d be a domain in the complex plane. And let's say that u plus iv is holomorphic on d. Then the level curves of u are orthogonal to the level curves of v. Remember like u is a function of two real variables and it spits out a real number. So you could graph it in R3. And I remember the level curves are what happens when you take the Z coordinate. So like the, the height coordinate, if you like to think of it that way. What if you like fix it to be a constant? So you kind of have like this topographic map idea. But what I'm saying is if you look at the two corresponding kind of topographic maps for u and for v, then those level curves are going to be orthogonal to each other. So anywhere the level curves intersect, we're saying they intersect at a 90 degree angle. Uh, except possibly at any point where the uh, complex derivative is equal to zero. So here I've got a little picture of, I've got u is x squared minus y squared, and I'm setting it equal to some constant c. And I've got a little slider so that if I slide it around, I can change what c looks like here. And then I've got v is 2xy, and I'm setting that equal to some constant k, and I've got a little slider so you can see how k changes. So like when I fix a specific c and k, such as like they are right now, these would be uh, two level curves for u is x squared minus y squared, and for v is 2xy. So like these are the, again, like the topographic maps for those two 3D graphs there. And just what I wanna notice is, any time that the green intersects the red, in either case, that intersection happens at a right angle. And no matter how I drag these things, it's always going to be the case that these two curves in green and red always intersect each other at a right angle. So that's what I mean by the sets of level curves are going to be orthogonal to each other. So what we're going to try to do is prove this theorem here. How can we prove that the level curves of U are always going to be orthogonal to the level curves of V? except for maybe where the complex derivative of u plus iv is zero. So let's fix some constants c and k that are real numbers. And we're going to show that the curves of the form u equals c and v equals k intersect. 
And we're also going to assume that uh, the complex derivative is non-zero at the point of intersection. Then what we're going to show is that the intersection has to occur at a 90 degree angle. So let's play with the total differential. And you might remember this from calculus three. The total differential of u looks like du. And what it is, is it's partial u with x times dx plus partial u of y times dy. Now, when u is a constant, right, we fixed u to be constant here, then when you look at du, right, the differential, that will be zero. And so let's substitute that in. That says I get zero on the left, and that's all that's changed. What we could do then, though, is we could solve for dy dx. And remember, dy dx represents the slope of the curve u equals c. Uh, and you'll have an expression for the slope at any point x comma y that makes sense to plug in. So let's solve this equation for dy dx. So maybe you subtract the du dx uh, stuff over and then divide. And what you should get is uh, dy dx is minus partial u with x divided by partial u with y. And again, that formula tells you the slope of u of the curve u equals c at any point where, uh, where it makes sense to plug in an x and a y. We can do a similar argument to try to find a formula for the slope of v equals k of that curve. And you should come up with dy dx is minus partial v with x over partial v with y. And again, that expression gives the slope of, I should be a little more careful, of the curve v equals k, not just a v, that doesn't make sense, uh, at any point on the curve where this is defined. And now let's let x naught y naught be the point where these two curves u equals c and v equals k intersect each other. What we're going to do is we're going to compare the slope of the two curves at that particular point. And so if I plug in the point x naught y naught into both the slope formulas, that should give you two real numbers. So the first real number, we're going to call it m1. You should be having some college algebra vibes right now, like the first slope, the slope of u equals c at that point of intersection. We just said above, that's minus partial u with x divided by partial u with y. And what that notation there with the bar means plug in the point x naught y naught. So like plug that point into that little expression there, and that spits out a number that's the slope. Similarly, you've got another real number. You, you can figure out what the slope of v equals k is at that point x naught y naught by plugging in x naught y naught into your formula for the slope. And now what we're going to do is try to compare m1 and n2. So how do these two slopes compare to each other? Well, the CR equations let me do a nice little substitution. So again, CR equations tell me partial u with x is partial v with y, and partial u with y is minus partial v with x. And so M2, I could rewrite it. So here it is, not rewritten, just copy pasted. But the CR equations tell me that I could substitute. Well, minus dv dx is the same thing as du dy. And uh, my, I'm sorry, dv dy is the same thing as du dx. And that's, that number should also be evaluated at the point x naught y naught. And so what we want to do now is we want to compare M2, this expression, partial uy over partial ux, compare that to M1. Well, m1 was minus partial ux over partial uy. And what you hopefully notice or remember from college algebra, those two real numbers are opposite reciprocals of each other. And so what that means again, when two slopes are opposite reciprocals of each other, that means that uh, the two lines there, the two tangent lines, if you will, are perpendicular. And that's what we mean by saying that these two curves are orthogonal to each other at that particular point. 